This is Wrestling's Greatest Moments. Hey now, wrestling fans. It's time for another episode of Wrestling's Greatest Moments. Ric Flair's legendary career began in 1972, but as we'll see, it was his time in Jim Crockett Promotions where he transformed into the world-class performer nicknamed The Nature Boy. Sit back as Wrestling's Greatest Moments looks at Ric Flair, The Mid-Atlantic Years, 1976 to 1978, Part 1. Before we get started though, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell so you don't miss a single video. Ric Flair's career grew by leaps and bounds when he jumped to Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling in 1974, aka Jim Crockett Promotions. There, Flair adopted his Nature Boy persona and began his trademark woo catchphrase. However, in 1975, all seemed lost when he suffered a broken back in a plane crash. As we'll see, Flair defied the doctor's prediction that his career was over, returning stronger than ever and ready to conquer the wrestling world. In fact, Flair's success after his recovery would grow by leaps and bounds. The man who fell to earth. Ric Flair's October 4th, 1975 airplane crash appeared devastating at first. As mentioned in Ric Flair, the mid-Atlantic years 1974 to 1976, Flair suffered a, a compression fracture to his spine, putting his wrestling career in jeopardy. Promoter Jim Crockett Jr. must have felt there was hope as he allowed Flair to keep the Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Championship despite the traditional rule that a title had to be defended every 30 days. A combination of tremendous willpower and medical technology helped Ric Flair return to wrestling and in a much better shape than when he'd left. In his book, The Last Real World Champion, The Legacy of Nature Boy Ric Flair, Tim Hornbaker writes, Flair's weight dropped dramatically while on the sidelines, from over 250 pounds to around 180, and he fought hard to regain his lost strength. He was under the care of Dr. David Johnston at Charlotte's New Miller Clinic, which specialized in treating injured athletes. It was determined that Flair didn't need surgery, and his recovery made tremendous strides by the end of 1975. Rick Flair could easily have become a babyface upon his return. Fans had spent months sending their well wishes to the man they'd once despised. According to Tim Hornbaker, within 10 days of the crash, he, Flair, had received nearly 1,000 letters from well wishers. Interestingly, Flair didn't turn babyface, instead doubling down on his heel act. As Flair recalls in his memoir to be the man, in early 1976, I strolled in the WRAL studios in my suit and sunglasses to an audience that really didn't want to boo me. Announcer Ed Carparell handed me a stack of get well cards and letters from the fans. I contemplated the pile scornfully, said that I was only going to keep the cards from Raquel Welch and Joey Heatherton, then threw everything else on the floor. The reality was that while a Flair babyface turn would likely be successful, there was still too much money in keeping Flair as a heel, whether it was his single bouts or his teams with heels such as Black Jack Mulligan and his storyline cousins, Gene and Ole Anderson. While we're on the subject of cousins, a quick correction from our previous Ric Flair video, as Wrestling's Greatest Moments referred to Ric Flair and tag team partner Rip Hawk as cousins. The two were actually portrayed with Hawk being Flair's uncle and Flair, Hawk's nephew. Ric Flair's return wasn't perfect. The Nature Boy was protective of his back after spending months rehabbing it. One particular move concerned him, the backdrop. According to Flair, he never took them the same way. Nonetheless, I couldn't get myself to fall flat. If you watch me in the ring now, I still land on my left side after a backdrop, never the center of my back like people are taught in wrestling school. Ric Flair modified his wrestling style to fit his new physique. Now that he dropped considerable weight, he no longer relied on power-based moves. He added several signature moves including knife edge chops, which Flair adopted from Wahoo McDaniel and Terry Funk. The Ric Flair of 1976 was a much different wrestler than just a year earlier. However, Flair's personality never changed as he maintained his Nature Boy approach in promos, boasting of his amorous accomplishments, his wealth, and of course his success in the ring. By 1976, Flair had adopted the persona he would become best known for. Yes, he would spend years perfecting it, but by 1976, Flair had a clear direction for his promos, including his trademark, Woo! And where did Flair get his famous woo? It's often been said that if you're going to steal, you steal from the best. 
Booker George Scott had Flair take on some of the qualities of legendary NWA World Heavyweight Champion Nature Boy Buddy Rogers, although Flair would craft these qualities to make them his own, and Flair likewise adopted his Woo! from someone famous, in this case singer Jerry Lee Lewis. In his memoir Nature Boy, Flair discusses how he came to use it. While driving to WRAL Studios one day to cut promos, I heard Jerry Lee Lewis on the radio and I decided that I liked the way he screamed "woo" in the middle of great balls of fire. Not long afterward, I gave it a try. Everywhere I go, the people are shouting "woo." There goes the big boss man. Now that the Nature Boy was back, it was time for him to prove he was ready to do what he did best. Entertain the fans by driving them into a frenzy to buy tickets so they could see him get his just desserts. Bad blood. It's been said that time heals all wounds but not in the case of Flair and our tribe of Wahoo McDaniel. McDaniel hadn't forgotten how Flair had cheated his way to winning the Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Championship and he was determined to regain his belt. Jim Crockett Promotions had several singles titles, including the Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Championship, the NWA Mid-Atlantic Television Championship, and its version of the United States Heavyweight Championship, which debuted in 1975. However, Every title meant something, and while there was a hierarchy, with the United States title often dictating the number one contender for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship whenever the champion came to the area, a look at various JCP programs shows just how prestigious the belt was. According to historian and author Dick Bourne, when Flair returned to action following the plane crash in late January, it seemed the main focus of the promotion was on Wahoo and Flair trading the title back and forth. These matches occurred when house shows were the lifeblood of wrestling promotions. Promoters needed hot programs to sell tickets, and Flair vs. McDaniel also had incredible staying power. For much of the year, it was Flair and Wahoo, so much so that the Mid-Atlantic title would frequently be the main event on top of the shows, even when the US title or NWA World Tag Team titles were defended on the same card. Flair vs. Wahoo was the big show, and it was the big draw. Everyone wanted to see these two go at it. The wrestling industry was much different in this era, and while a promoter could try to extend the feud, it wouldn't matter if fans weren't interested in seeing more matches. Here, Booker George Scott and the players involved found various ways to keep the fans invested in seeing Wahoo and Flair fight it out. The Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Championship played a crucial role in this as Wahoo would regain the title, only for Flair to find a way to cheat his way back to victory. In fact, the title would change hands five times in 1976 between Flair and Wahoo. The title changes often involve controversy and stipulation matches. In one match, Flair struck Wahoo with a broken table leg in the head. Unbeknownst to either grappler, there was a nail sticking out of the wood, and Wahoo suffered a deep cut right above his eye. Although he needed 40 stitches to close it, it could have been even worse. Still, the injury sidelined Wahoo. Coincidentally, wrestler Ole Anderson was slashed that same night by a 79-year-old fan nearly dying from blood loss. In his memoir, Inside Out, Ole recalls how he nearly died from the slashing and punched the old man while defending himself. Nevertheless, Anderson was painted as the villain. Was he an old man? Yes, he was. I used to joke about it. Yeah, but his knife was only six months old. If you average them out, the two of them were only 40 years old. Ole needed 100 stitches to close up the wound. Nonetheless, he and Wahoo were wrestling within days, a sign of their toughness and dedication to the sport. As far as Ric Flair is concerned, Wahoo was one of the toughest. Wahoo was just an incredibly tough guy. Not just the way he wrestled, but the condition he wrestled under. He wrestled hurt. He wrestled sick. I remember he had a vasectomy at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, then wrestled at 8 o'clock that night. Wahoo would wrestle under any conditions. He had an incredible work ethic. He wrestled long matches and was as tough as anybody in the ring. He was a real man's man. Wahoo's toughness and flares was evident from their grueling schedule and the many high-intensity stipulation matches they fought in. Wahoo and Flair's battles over the titles spilled over into tag team matches, with Flair teaming with fellow heels Blackjack Mulligan, who Flair often teamed with and became close friends with behind the scenes, and Angelo King Kong Mosca, and Wahoo getting help from Rufus R. Jones, Paul Jones, and Andre the Giant. As for the title matches, Flair and Wahoo fought in no disqualification matches, hair versus title matches, and even fence, 
aka cage matches, the shape of things to come. On September 4th, 1976, fans saw a hint of things to come when Dusty Rhodes challenged Flair for the Mid-Atlantic title during a brief tour in the region. Rhodes pinned Flair for the apparent win, only for the decision to be reversed, a situation Rhodes would book so many times in the 1980s that it earned the nickname the Dusty Finish. The escape clause that saved Flair's title was his persistent foe Wahoo McDaniel. During the match, Flair placed his foot on the rope, only for McDaniel to move it. Flair protested, and he returned to Mid-Atlantic TV with the title, a blow for Rhodes and Wahoo, working the Mecca. In 1976, Flair worked two dates for the Worldwide Wrestling Federation's Vincent McMahon at the promotion's Madison Square Garden home base. The Nature Boy defeated Pete Sanchez on March 1st and Frankie Williams on April 26. In addition, Flair traveled to Eddie Graham's Championship Wrestling from Florida promotion, defeating Abe Jacob on April 17th. Flair's trips outside the Mid-Atlantic area were important and, no and another sign of his rising star. Flair's bookings in New York and Florida are indicative of the working relationships that existed between promoters. The brief jaunts were a great way to increase exposure and athletes benefited from excursions outside their home territory. Performing at Madison Square Garden was a major addition to Flair's resume, and the mainstream wrestling public was becoming acquainted with the blonde heel from Charlotte. It seemed as if there was no end to Flair's success, and as 1976 progressed, this became even more apparent. The Dream Team is born. By September 1976, Flair's feud with Wahoo showed no end. However, a new player was introduced to the drama, second-generation grappler Greg Valentine. Flair had teamed with Greg's father, Johnny Valentine, until Johnny was forced to retire due to a career-ending injury suffered in the same accident that sidelined Flair for months. The new Flair Valentine team was everything promoters could ask for in two heels. Two capable wrestlers who nevertheless took shortcuts and arrogantly boasted of their wins and the spoils of victory. Valentine was quickly pushed in singles matches and became Flair's regular partner during the Nature Boys tag team bouts against Wahoo. Flair's alliance with Valentine also allowed Mid-Atlantic Wrestling to begin two new programs involving the two. The first involved Valentine and McDaniel, with Greg continuing his father's longtime feud against Wahoo and taking it to new levels. Around this time, Greg was still billed as Johnny Valentine's brother, due to concerns Johnny might have been perceived as old due to having a son who was an active wrestler. Ric Flair played a massive role in Valentine's feud with Wahoo, often interfering in the two wrestlers' matches and dishing out a two-on-one beating to the popular babyface on more than one occasion. Flair's role in the feud showed that the Nature Boy was now a wrestler capable of lending his star power to other wrestlers. Rick's association with Valentine added heat to the hammer, who was already enraging fans with his brutal tactics in the ring. And this was just the start. A second program was in the works that would lead to one of the area's most famous fights, Vendetta. Flair's partnership with Valentine also led to a split between Flair and his kayfabe cousins, the Andersons. Rick's already epic-level ego had grown more since his partnership with Valentine, while Flair would split with the Andersons with Valentine at his side. It might have happened with Flair and Blackjack Mulligan. Flair and Mulligan frequently teamed together, and during an interview with Gene and Ole Anderson nearby, Flair teased taking the titles from his cousins with Mulligan's help. Nothing came of this, but it hinted at Flair's growing ambition. Once thick as thieves, the Andersons and Flair had a sizzling split, which led to Valentine helping Flair battle his cousins. The feud began after a six-man tag match between the team of Flair, Valentine, and Gene Anderson against Tim Woods, Dino Bravo, and Sandy Scott. According to Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling David Chappell's article, Rick Flair and Greg Valentine, the Mid-Atlantic Dream Team, Part 1. Flair tagged Anderson in during the match, only for Gene to eat a dropkick from Sandy Scott and confront Flair about putting him in a bad position. Flair responded by slapping Gene, and the war was on. Flair appeared on one of the territory's weekly TV shows, proclaiming, I got too big for the Andersons. Gene Anderson was trying to lead the match, telling me what to do, and by now you know as well as anybody in the wrestling world knows. And now Gene and Ole Anderson know it. Nobody tells me what to do. I go my own way, do my own thing, and I know how to handle myself in the wrestling ring. Thus began arguably the territory's most notorious battle of the bullies. Matches involving two heel teams showing no mercy for each other. 
The feud was a shocking win for Flair and Valentine as they defeated Gene and Oli for the NWA World Tag Team Championship on December 26, 1976. The Andersons had dominated the tag division for years, and the Flair-Valentine combo's win was another reminder of how far Flair and Valentine had come. Although Flair dropped the Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Championship to Wahoo McDaniel the following night in a no disqualification match, Flair didn't let that slow him down. 1977 would be another exciting year for Ric Flair as he defended the NWA World Tag Team Championship, collected even more titles, and met an opponent with whom his career would become intertwined for decades, Ricky Steamboat. What do you think of Ric Flair's early years in Jim Crockett promotions? Did you get to see any of Flair's career from this era? Share your thoughts in the comment section and let us know if there's any videos you'd like Wrestling's Greatest Moments to cover. In the meantime, subscribe to our channel, follow us on X and Instagram, and spread the good news about Wrestling's Greatest Moments, the channel that celebrates the squared circle.